Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So welcome back to our research webinar series 2.0, organized by the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation. My name is Tengku Shahrul Anwar, and I'm the moderator for today. So today we are so honored to have our very own speaker, who is Professor Dr. Wong Tinghui, which he will be delivered a topic entitled skin delivery of a small molecule and macromolecule drugs for cancer and diabetes treatment. So before I go any further, allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. So Professor Dr. Wong Ting Wui obtained his Bachelor of Pharmacy way back in 1994 and also obtained his PhD degree in 1999 and both actually from the National University of Singapore. And currently, Professor Dr. Wong Ting Wui is a professor, a research fellow as well as the head for the non-destructive biomedical and pharmaceutical research center here in I Promise. And Professor Wong has published over 110 peer article reviews and mainly in the Quarta One journal. So without further ado, I would like to invite the one and only Professor Dr. Wong Tin Wei. All right. All right, so, Prof. Yeah, thank you. So good morning, I'm Ting Wei from uh, I Promise. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank the organizing team uh, for the kind arrangement for me to be here uh, to share some of the laboratory findings on skin delivery of small molecule and macromolecular drugs for cancer and diabetes treatment. So I will first touch on skin cancer uh, in today's presentation, the cutaneous melanoma. Uh, skin cancer is one of the most common malignancies of human now occur mainly uh, in the white populations. Now, over a million cutaneous melanoma cases are detected per year. And this uh, melanoma is due to multiple pathogenesis uh, with ultraviolet radiation, the sunlight uh, being the main governing factor. Now you may wonder what about Asia population? Now we do contract melanoma, though not at a very high propensity. And the types of melanoma that Asian populations contract is the acral, Latigenous melanoma commonly occur uh, at the palms and at the soul. And the induction factors uh, is different from those of the white populations. Uh, it is due to local trauma and agricultural chemicals. And cutaneous melanoma uh, is the most aggressive types of skin cancer. Now, it actually is evolved uh, primarily due to the proliferation of melanoma site at the dermal and epidermal junctions of the skin. This is the surface morphologies of cutaneous melanoma. Now, initially, the melanoma may just grow in the epidermis, the upper skin surfaces. With time, it may turn severe, and the melanoma can actually penetrate, penetrate deep down into the dermis region or into the lower dermis and into the bloodstream. So if you look at the Southeast Asia perspective, now Singapore has been very active lately uh, about skin cancer, about cutaneous melanoma, and Singapore and Brunei uh, have been reported uh, to exhibit a high propensity of malignant melanoma lately. Now, about Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines, uh, though the report on melanoma is not uh, evidence, but UV-related cataracts uh, has been rising in their propensity. Now, this indirectly uh, giving us some, some hint about the coming of cutaneous melanoma in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines. Now, melanoma is overlooked and undertreated in Asia, particularly Southeast Asia population. Now, by the time the Asian melanoma patients go to the doctor, usually they are diagnosed with advanced disease, a poorer pro prognosis than the Caucasian patients. So we have been ignoring um, cutaneous melanoma for Asia and Southeast Asia region. Uh, majority of the efforts are actually put up by the white population. So treatment of the skin cancers, uh, typically surgery, radiation therapy, or chemotherapies through topical uh, applications. Now, many drugs and many biologics uh, have been used uh, in treatments of cutaneous melanoma. I wish to highlight to you 5-chloroureacil uh, is, is a conventional drugs 
is rather low cost and has been uh, used in the hospital for long. Now, the late clinical trial found that uh, 5-FU indeed is active against the melanoma. Now, should we uh, wish to implement a local therapy uh, on the skin cancer, on the cutaneous melanoma? So what are the barriers or challenges that we face? Principally, there are two. First, the skin penetrations as well as melanoma cellular membranes. They are the barriers for effective drug transport and uh, good therapeutics outcome. So on this note, uh, these presentations uh, wish to highlight to you uh, some of the innovative ideas that have been implemented by our laboratories uh, to overcome skin and melanoma membranes hurdles and to provide a better drug transport, a greater drugs bioavailability at the cancer site. Now let's take a look on the skin uh, microstructure. Principally, it consists of three layers epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. Now, the topmost layers of epidermis is known as stratum corneum. Now, this is the primary penetration barriers uh, to all drugs. Now, in the, in the pharmacy profession, we actually regard that the drugs can be transported across the skin by three modes, either via diffusions through the epidermis or the stratum corneum, through the hair follicle and going into the skin, or through the sweat glands. But knowing that hair follicle and sweat gland only occupy 0.1% of the total skin area, hence the majority of the pharmaceutical researcher, we actually focus on transporting drugs to stratum corneum. So we need to overcome these uh, primary penetration barriers in order to elicit a very good drug transport. Now let's take a look, a close look uh, at the stratum corneum. Now stratum corneum, principally contains of keratin-rich, protein-rich uh, corneocyte arranged in a systematic manner in the lipid matrix, which is pink in color. Now, if you look closely at the lipid matrix, you will realize that this lipid matrix consists of uh, aqueous pore alternating with lipid bilayer. So it consists of polar aqueous pore and hydrophobic lipid bilayer. And these lipids uh, can be constituted of cholesterol, fatty acid, ceramide. I wish to highlight to you, low lipid is generally hydrophobic and water insoluble. If you look at the chemical structure of the ceramide, it does contain of OH bond, NH bond, and carbonyl. So part of the domains of the lipid indeed is still hydrophilic. So transportation of the drugs through skin uh, broadly is mediated through true pathway one transcellular, the second is intracellular. Now you could imagine that upon application of drug on the skin surface, if the drug is transported through transcellular routes, it needs to go through layers and after layers of corneocyte. So this will not be easy. So there are a lot of hindrance, a lot of cellulose will block and barrier. Now what about intercellular routes? The drugs, depending on whether it is hydrophilic or hydrophobic, it may be transported through intercellular routes, either through the aqueous pores or through the lipid bilayers. Now, note that this intercellular route is tortuous. There's a lot of twists and turns. Penetration and transportation of the drug through stratum corneum is not entirely easy. Right? So the systematic structures of the stratum corneum, which is known as bricks and mortar, is really hindered uh, a good and effective uh, drug transport. So what should we do? So over the past 30 years, uh, the scientists, the doctors, the pharmacists have done a very simple thing. Basically, you need to destroy transiently and reversibly about the skin surface structure and to allow the drugs to be transported across, followed by healing of the skin uh, within a short span of time. So if you look through the past 30 years, the various technology and techniques uh, have been invented for skin drug delivery. It can be classified as passive, active. Now, passive technology basically involves formulation, involves medicines that you bought from the counter or you get from the prescription. Now, these medicines can be made from water and the water can actually hydrate the skin. It can actually engorge in the aqueous pore of the skin within the intercellular roots. The aqueous pore become larger. This will allow a drug to go through. And some of the skin medicine may contain chemical penetration enhancer, 
such as oleic acid, ethanol, and surfactant. Now, these chemicals are able to fluidize the intercellular lipid, or it can even extract, remove the intercellular lipid, making the aqueous pore larger, enable drugs to go through the skin uh, at an easier manner. Of course, nanocarrier, being the late favorite of oral scientists globally, this nanocarrier can be made from polymers, uh, oligomers. Indeed, it may contain waters. It may contain oleic acid, ethanol, and surfactant. And this chemical can help to fluidize the lipid, remove the lipid, and making the aqueous pore larger. Of course, nanocarrier, as the name suggested, it has a very small geometry. It itself can also penetrate the skin, bring the drug across the skin, and release the drug in the lower part of the skin. Now, the active methods uh, involve stratum conium removal by adhesive tape. Of course, this is a very traditional method no one is ever using. Microneedles, you may heard of, especially the female. Now, a lot of microneedle is sold along with cosmetic or cosmeceuticals. So this needle can porosify the skin, making holes, allow the drugs to go through. We can also shock the skin using electric method such as ion topheresis, electroporation, or by ultrasound, which you may see in the Instagram, ultrasound sonophoresis. And the other two methods are photomechanical wave and pressurized gas. Now, among all active technology, microwave being the latest technology that has been uh, innovated for use in skin drug delivery. And this microwave technology is initiated in Malaysia and in our laboratory. So today's presentation, I'm going to highlight uh, how do we combine microwave technology with nanotechnology in order to deliver the cancer therapeutic through the skin effective. Now let's take a look how nanocarriers uh, deliver drugs. Now upon applications of nanocarrier or nanomedicines uh, on the skin, now you will see that this nanocarrier can either release the drug on the surfaces of the skin, now followed by drug penetrations into the skin in order to target the cancer cells. Alternatively, the nanocarrier may fuse with the stratum conium and release the drug at the top surfaces of the skin. Of course, nanocarrier being small, it can actually penetrate through the hair follicles or the intercellular roots of the stratum conium. So as such, these uh, nanocarriers uh, will be uh, reaching the lower dermis or even into the systemic circulation and release the drugs uh, thereafter. Now, the skin drug transport by nanocarriers appear easy, but it can be quite complex. And basically, it determines it is affected by the size and zeta potential of the nanocarrier. Now, theoretically, the smaller the nanocarrier, we will presume that it can actually penetrate the skin and bring more drugs into the skin. However, the reality may not be true. Now, if you see that, uh, the relationship between the skin drug transport versus the size of the vesicular carrier nano emulsions or polysaccharide nanoparticles, you realize that some larger nanoparticle can transport drugs better. And a lot of nanoparticle that is small, but the propensity of skin penetration is rather low. So the relationship between the size of the nanocarrier and skin drug transport is not entirely linear. Now, what about zeta potential? which is the surface charges of the nanocarrier. You will see there is no straightforward relationship for vesicular carriers such as liposome, atosome, transfersome, polymersome. There is no direct relationship between skin drug transport and the zeta potentials of the nanoparticles. Now for nano emulsion, we realize that a surface charges between minus 10 to minus 20 millivolt appears to favor skin drug transport. Now, what about polysaccharide nanoparticles, such as aeroginate nanoparticles, chitosan nanoparticles, and pectin nanoparticles? We realize that positively charged nanoparticles and negatively charged nanoparticles perform better in skin drug delivery than those of a neutral uh, ranges. So the positively charged nanoparticles uh, can transport drug easily. Now, this is uh, not difficult to imagine because uh, human or skin 
basically is made from anionic lipids. So all humans are negatively charged. So the polysaccharide nanoparticles being positively charged, it can be attracted to the anionic lipids of the skin favorably. And this will promote nanoparticle entry into the skin and drug transport. Now, what about negatively charged nano emulsion or negatively charged polysaccharide nanoparticles being negative? Of course, it will repel the anionic lipids of the skin. So your skin will turn softer. So once the skin turns softer or the lipid turns softer, the aqueous pore may be larger. Thus allow more drugs to go through. And it may actually also allow some of the nano emulsion globule or polysaccharide nanoparticles to enter into the skin. Looking through the relationship between size and zeta potential of the nano carrier with skin drug transport, I hope you can imagine now uh, it's not entirely easy and straightforward when we design nanomedicine and hope that it makes wonder. So pharmaceutical scientists uh, has commonly advocated uh, a nanomedicine or a skin medicine it must be combined with an active technology in order to promote skin drug delivery. Now, this active technology can be microwave, can be microneedles, can be electrical method or ultrasound, right? Now, we are hoping that this active technology can actually porosify the skin to a large extent so that the delivery of the nanomedicines will not be able to or will not necessarily depending on the size and zeta potential of the nano carrier. So this will make our drug delivery very straightforward, right? Now in our laboratory, we actually have started the project utilizing microwave as a skin penetration enhancer, as an active technology in skin drug delivery. Now you may wonder why do we use microwave? That is related to our former project starting year 2000 when we first joined UITM. Now we found that the microwave, uh, upon treating solid medicine, such as solid microparticles, solid bits, solid tablets, solid mini tablets, this microwave is able to interact with polysaccharide, protein, and lipidic materials. Now we found that it can actually uh, uh, fluidize the conformations of polymers such as polysaccharide, proteins, or lipids. And knowing that skin is made from proteins and lipids, we will wonder whether the microwave will do the same to the skin. On this note, we actually read a lot about the microwave and trying to find a possibility uh, to use microwave as a radiation so skin penetration enhancer. Now you can see that in the medical industry, 900 to 2,500 megahertz microwave uh, has been used for cancer treatments such as rectal, bladders, and prosthetic. Also, it has been used to relieve the stiffness of joint, to have deep tissue heating uh, in the wound uh, area. It has been used to eradicate Staphylococcus aureus, right, which is uh, pyrogenics and may cause death. Now, in our laboratory, uh, we have been using some microwave for the past uh, 15 years to design control release medicine we have the ability of microwave to heat, to elasticize, to induce crosslink, to coexivate or denature the polymeric matrix, or amorphize the drug crystal. Now note that the intensity of microwave that we use is 80 to 975 watt. It's, it's a kitchen microwave. So it can cook the skin uh, in, in few seconds. And the duration that we use in solid medicine treatment ranges from five to 60 minutes, involves single and multiple cycle. So all these uh, irradiation condition that we have been using for our past study will not be applicable uh, uh, in skin drug delivery uh, project. On this note, we actually uh, browse through IP, uh, literatures, and also consult with uh, expert now, the conclusion derived is the microwave exposure limits to the skin should be lower than 1 milliwatt per cm square. So this is the safety limits cutoff. And it is preferable to use a higher frequency microwave because microwave of a higher frequency will have a lower wavelength. So it means that it will stay on the surfaces of the skin 
rather than penetrating into the distant organ, such as liver and kidney. Now, of course, logically, the duration of irradiation, we have to keep it as short as possible before any adverse effect uh, is derived. Just hold on, there's a uh, suddenly jam. Now, having all this uh, background information search, we then move on to carry out our very first experiment. Now, we treat the skin uh, from the directions of the upper epidermis uh, with microwave. Now, you can see that the untreated skin seems to have some folding structure. Now, treating of the skin, epidermis and stratum corneum with the right frequency, such as 2450 megahertz, for a right duration, such as five minutes. I hope you can see that the stratum corneum has turned smoother. So it is presumed that the structure domain, the bricks and mortar structure of the stratum corneum has been removed. And this may be able to facilitate skin drug transport. So knowing that there's a chance of success, we then spearhead an uh, anti-cancer skin drug deliveries project. Now in this study, we use 5 floor uracil, which I have elaborated just now. Now, 5-FU is used because uh, it has been proven uh, to be effective in one of the trials. And 5-fluorouracil, although it is a small molecule, but it is very polar. So delivery of polar drug through skin has been known to be a challenge. And in this study, we adopt atrosome, which is an ethanol-based uh, liposome system as the carrier of 5-fluorouracil. Our intention is very simple. Now, we would like to increase the skin drug penetration and skin drugs retention. So we would like to have more drugs to penetrate and retain in the skin, but with minimal systemic rise in the blood. So we hope that our drugs will appear minimally in the blood. So this study basically is aimed to treat the cutaneous melanoma locally as a topical therapy. Now, we designed three variants of atosome, E5, E10, and E15, which contains of 5% ethanol, 10% ethanol, and 15% ethanol. Now, the result shows that the E5 with the lowest percentage of ethanol is preferable because it induces a lesser systemic rise in the blood concentration, and it also induces a higher skin drug penetration and retention. So this will be favorable for us uh, uh, when topical therapies or local therapy is concerned. Now we further investigate why so. Now through using the infrared imaging technique, now you will see that using the E5, a lot of uh, atosomes are accumulated in the epidermis. However, if we formulate E10 or E15, perhaps this atosome with a high content of ethanol, the skin can be highly fluidized. The ethosome may actually penetrate through the epidermis, moving into the dermis, and disappear in the systemic circulation. Now, you may wonder why E5 accumulate wonders uh, in the epidermis. So let's look at the particle size. It's considered larger than others. So being larger in particles, though nano, it will not be able to penetrate deep down into the dermis so favorably. Likewise, if you look at the charges of the atosome, it is relatively more negatively charged compared to E10 and E15. So this uh, atosome, they are able to penetrate the skin, but they are not able to go deep down into the lower dermis due to the repulsion with the anionic lipids of the skin. So for this reason, E5, seems to be favorable. And you may ask me, in that case, to promote local skin drug retention, why not we prepare E1 or E2 with a lower percentage of ethanol? Now, we can prepare, but the drug penetration will be lower for a simple reason. Uh, using a lower ethanol content, the ethosome will be less flexible less elastic. So it will be hard for the atosome to squeeze themselves through the intercellular roots if they are rigid in structure. So on this note, formulation approach to further enhance skin drug retention uh, is not uh, viable, it's not feasible. 
So what are the possible routes that can be used in order to promote skin drug retentions by means of Atosol. Hence, uh, we recall uh, the previous studies of ours uh, where microwave is used as a skin drugs penetration enhancer. Now, in the previous runs, uh, we actually have uh, treated the skin with microwave, such as a stratum conium with the microwave, and we realized that the intercellular roots is getting bigger. Now, upon treating the skin with microwave, an application of solid medicines in the form of film or in the form of membrane, what we realize is that the drugs will then release from the solid medicines into the enlarged intercellular spaces of the epidermis. The microwave then facilitate drugs penetrations into the skin. Now, what about if we treat the skin with microwave to enlarge the intercellular roots? followed by the applications of semi-solid medicine, such as hydrogels. Now, a total, totally different scenario is found. Now, what we have noted is that upon applications of hydrogel, no doubt the drugs can penetrate into the intercellular roots of the skin, but the small polymeric molecule of the hydrogels, they can likewise penetrate into the intercellular roots of the stratum conium. And these small little polymeric molecules, they are binder, they are adhesive. They will then cement and bind the drugs in the upper part of the skin and promote local skin drug retention. So it appears to us that solid medicine may not be a good deal, but semi-solid medicines uh, appears to be an ideal delivery vehicle because it allows a higher local uh, drug retentions uh, in the skin. So on this note, we then move forward to combine microwave technology with our liquid dosage form. Now, this is the in vitro study uh, using uh, skin harvested uh, from the spread dolly rats. Now, you can see if we treat the skin with the right microwave frequency and duration, there is a minimal rise in the drugs uh, in the systemic circulation. However, treating the skin with the correct frequency and the correct durations of microwave, you will see that the local skin drug retentions is being promoted. So in short, our guess, our hypothesis and estimations uh, have been proven by the in vitro study. Uh, this is uh, the same uh, FTR imaging, so where you can see that combinations of microwave uh, with atosome E5 can actually uh, increase the populations of atosome entering into the skin and promote skin drug retention. Now to understand uh, what exactly happens to the skin in response to microwave specifically, as well as atosome, and hence promote uh, local skin drug retentions and penetration, we then uh, conduct thermal analysis on the skin uh, to examine the lipid as well as protein regimes of the skin. Now we also conduct phototransform infrared study on the epidermis and dermis of the skin in response to microwave and atosome. Now, to avoid uh, confusion so with all this value, now I have actually drawn a schematic diagram. Now, you can see that stratum conium is keratin-rich coniocyte arranged systematically with intercellular roots contains of aqueous pore and lipid bilayer. Of course, dermis is supported by the second layers, which is known as a Epidermis is supported by the dermis. Now, upon treating the stratum conium with microwave, what will happen? Keratin within the coniocyte will actually has the conformation change from alpha helix to beta shift. So as a result, the keratin condense. Once the keratin condense, you will note that the coniocyte turns smaller. Second, the intercellular roots has the lipid bilayers uh, fluidized by the microwave irradiation. So shrinkage of coniocyte plus fluidization of the lipid bilayers uh, via microwave irradiation. So this will enlarge the intercellular roots or intercellular pore. And on this note, the atosome, the drugs uh, diffusions into the skin is thus uh, facilitated. A microwave has another concurrent effect. Now being a radiation, being a, a radiations that 
radiate in a volumetric uh, approach, you will see that it will be quite easy for the microwave uh, to interact with the epidermis as well as penetrate through the epidermis and interact with the dermis. Now, from our FTIR study, we had tentatively, I wouldn't say uh, completely, we tentatively we concluded that the extracellular fluids or extracellular matrix such as um, elastin, it may be swell and form a swollen matrix upon interacting with the microwave. So the dermis of the skin may swell. Now with the increased pore size of the intercellular roots, the drugs, the atosome penetration is facilitated through the epidermis and perhaps into the upper dermis. But these drugs and atosome uh, will not or will minimally penetrate through the lower dermis and into the bloodstream because they, their penetration, their diffusion process is blocked by the swollen matrix of the ex extracellular uh, proteins of dermis. So this is the mechanistic uh, insight uh, that we have developed so far you know, through various uh, spectroscopy and thermal analysis. Now we further examine the validity of our in vitro findings uh, using in vivo uh, analysis. Now we treat the rats, uh, the skins of rats uh, with microwave, followed by the applications of drug-loaded atosome. Now you will see that combinations of microwave and atosome will result in low appearance of the drugs uh, in the plasma compared to rats that are solely treated by atosome. And treating the rats with microwave with atosome, the skin drug retention is higher. So our in vivo result does parallel uh, with our in vitro findings. So combinations of microwave with atosome appears to be a, a useful approach to promote local skin drug retention and to reduce the drug's appearance in the blood plasma, which can be unfavorable as a result of adverse drug reaction. Now, knowing that how the atosome and how the microwave remove or overcome the hurdles of skin barrier, now we now move on to look at how atosome and microwave can be used in combinations in order to overcome the melanoma membrane barrier and to promote a higher level of cytotoxicity. Now, in these studies, uh, we have found that the drug-loaded atosome is effective against melanoma. Now, this is uh, no, no new story. But what most interesting is that microwave by itself, compared to blank atosome without drugs or compared to pure 5 fluorouracil the microwave appears to be a better weapon to kill the melanoma. And of course, combinations of both microwave and drug loaded atosome, they actually bring about a synergistic influence on the cytotoxicity of the melanoma. Now, to further explain why this happened, we conduct thermal analysis and infrared analysis on the melanoma cell. Now, we realized that atosome or microwave, they can actually interact uh, with the lipids and fluidize the membranes of the lipids. So, as such, the fluidized membrane uh, is more permeable to the atosome and more atosome can actually penetrate it into the melanoma and exert the cytotoxic action. Now, the combinations of microwave and atosome remarkably fluidize the lipid domains of the, of the membrane uh, through interacting with the phosphate moieties of the melanoma membrane. Now, this brings about a higher level of atosome being diffused into the melanoma cell. Now, the ease of diffusing atosome with the use of microwave uh, on the melanoma cell line is uh, proven by the confocal electron microscopy. Now, in this uh, microscopy uh, monograph, you will see that more atosome are actually being entrapped in the melanoma cell line when this melanoma cell line is being treated with microwave followed by the application of atosome. And we then move on, uh, trying to understand uh, what are the mechanisms uh, that, uh, of microwave that render a higher cellular uptake of atosome. Now, we actually uh, treat the cell line uh, with variant pharmacological membrane inhibitor, 
such as cropomazine, nystatin, genistein, and wadmanine. And we realized that the microwave actually facilitate the autosome diffusion or endocytosis into the melanoma via the lipid rough pathway. Right? So interaction of microwave with lipid is not surprising. Although conventionally, we understand that lipid prefers to interact with polar moiety, such as water. But in the earlier slide, I have actually highlighted to you in the biological object, though lipid is hydrophobic, it does contain polar moieties that can interact with the microwave favorably, thus elicit fluidization of membrane and facilitate the drug entry, the atosome entry into the melanoma. Now, having done with uh, liquid atosome, uh, we are thinking of uh, taking up a higher challenge. So we prepare solid nanoparticles this time. Now, we first conjugate the 5 floor cells with chitosan by covalence reaction. And we process this conjugate into the nanoparticles by nanospray drying technique. And we apply it onto the skin. And you can find out the same uh, outcome is derived, treating the skin with the right microwave and the correct durations. You could see that the solid particles, solid nanoparticle can actually penetrate through the skin rather favorably. And one interesting findings about the solid nanoparticles and microwave interplay is that, now note that the solid chitosan nanoparticles, it can actually fluidize the lipid bilayer through interacting with the palmitic acid region, whereas microwave is interacting with ceramide too. So what does this tell us? This tells us that both chitosan and microwave interact with the skin lipids of the skin. Skin lipids via a different region, palmitic and ceramide too respectively. And this is aptly explained why they can act in a synergistic manner to promote the skin drug delivery. So they, they allow a larger or higher levels of skin fluidization through lipid mobilization. Now, in another studies, uh, we begin to worry uh, the nanoparticles that will penetrate into the systemic circulations, and that may actually exert a side effect uh, if this drug uh, is being introduced to the normal cell population. And in the third study, we actually conjugate chitosan 5 fluorouracils with folate. Now, this folate is a targeting ligand. It's just like our GPS system, our way system in the mobile phone. It can actually detect and identify cancer cell and bring the nanoparticles to interact with the cancer cell. So using folate, the entire nanoparticle will be uh, more specific in terms of their action. So even though the nanoparticle is leak and penetrated into the systemic circulation, perhaps nanoparticles of this nature will be good both for local treatment as well as systemic treatments of the metastasized cancer. The same conclusion we derived whereby combination of microwave with the nanoparticles will promote skin drug retention and the endocytosis of solid nanoparticles by uh, by means of microwave is promoted to the lipid rough pathway. Now, understanding that chitosan 5 floor folate nanoparticle may be used for systemic treatments of the melanoma, uh, we ask ourselves uh, how much folate is sufficient. So, our late study, which we have just published, is the folate content should be around 20%. And uh, considering the size of the nanoparticles and shape of the nanoparticle, this translates to a folate density of 2.7 times 10 to the power minus 6% per nanometer cube. So this is one of our latest findings that we did with DIM is very crucial in order to design a good nanoparticles without excessive use of folate or underuse of folate as targeting ligand. Now, so much so for cancer. Now, what about diabetes? Now, transdermal insulin uh, has been advocated uh, as Inhala inhalation insulin has failed yeah, despite a few trials by the big companies and oral insulins uh, they do have some good data but it's still rather challenging uh, uh, to be investigated upon now to deliver the insulin across the skin into the blood and to act on the relevance of organ commonly in pharmacy fatty acids such as oleic acid 
linoleic acid, linolenic acids are being used. Now, this acid has a very special structure. You can see commonly it's like a V shape. So upon applicating on upon applications on the skin, this V shaped fatty acid can actually disturb the systematic structure of lipid bilayer within the intercellular roots. So it presumably can enlarge the pore of the skin and hence uh, favor skin drug transport. But in our study, we have found out fatty acid actually demotes or not entirely favorable for transdermal insulin delivery. Microwave indeed show a very prominent result. You can see that with time, a lot of insulin, close to 80 over percent of insulin uh, can be uh, sustained release into the systemic circulation. So we will wonder why microwave is better than fatty acid. So we have conducted the infrared study, uh, thermal analysis, uh, some of the scanning electron microscopy study, as well as transepidermal water loss study. Now you will see that if we treat the skin with microwave, the skin will turn very porous to the extent that uh, water can be lost from the inner part of the organs to the exterior environments. So the microwave improves skin permeability to a great extent. And exactly for this reason, this then facilitate the skin drug transport of insulin. So you can see that compared to injection, our microwave does uh, promote skin insulin transport into the blood to a great extent. Now, this is an in vivo study now, compared to those uh, without treatment. So we will wonder why microwave is so wonderful compared to fatty acid, uh, which is conventionally used by the formulation scientists. Now, we have found out that treating the skin, stratum conium in short, with fatty acid. Now, what will this fatty acid does? The fatty acid first will penetrate through the intercellular roots uh, unfortunately, apart from fluidizing the lipid, the fatty acid can also be retained in the intercellular roots of the skin. Now, this fatty acid, as the name suggested, is fatty. For example, the oleic acid contains uh, 18 carbon chain length, so they are rather hydrophobic. The retention of the fatty acid in the intercellular roots will then hinder the penetration's uh, capacity of the macromolecular drugs, in this case, the uh, insulin. Microwave is different. Microwave can enlarge the aqueous pore or enlarge the intercellular roots without depositing any hydrophobic barriers. So microwave, in a way, can then promote macromolecular insulin transport at a greater ease. So I hope uh, you have gotten the ideas of our work so far. Allow me a few seconds. I wish to change to another. All right, let me see. Now, we have been conducting uh, microwave projects for the purpose of skin drug delivery uh, for about 12 years. Now, apparently this technique uh, seems to be workable, but of course it is still in the infancy stage. Uh, a lot of experiment will still needs to be conducted. I just wish to highlight uh, where we are now globally. Now, if you look through the scopus, typing the right keywords such as microwave and skin drug delivery, now you will note that uh, we are still leading in the world by a few articles, a few evidences uh, more than others. And if you look at the university, now UITM, we are actually uh, ahead of many countries such as USA, Europe, India, and Middle East. So on this note, uh, we still uh, wish to pursue microwave as a skin drug penetration enhancer for the purpose of skin drug delivery, either by means of topicals or by means of transdermal uh, delivery. So I hope you can still see the screen of the PowerPoint. So, Prior to ending the presentation, uh, I promise uh, for the past uh, 17 years, uh, have been planning, executing, and in fact, we have been realizing precision health 
as the future healthcare models uh, globally. Now, in the case of a microwave, now you may wonder what is the implications of microwave in precision uh, health and precision medicine. Now, precision medicine basically will allow us to find the right drugs and right dose now, based on the genomics or proteomics profiles of the patients. Now, however, using the right drugs with the right, dr right dose, for example, instead of uh, 50 milligram, if we are able to reduce to 10 milligram, but that doesn't mean that we will administer to the patients of 10 milligram drugs because each and every patients, they are different uh, in the anatomy and physiological profile. Their body construct is different, the heartbeat, the blood flow rates, everything is, is different between the individual or sometimes even within the individual, depending on their age, depending on their health conditions. So if we wish to deliver the right drug dose into the patients, indeed, so we need a very good drug delivery device, such as the good nano carrier, as well as a very good active technology, such as microwave, in order to reduce the inter as well as intra individual anatomical barriers, variations between the patients. So with microwave, in combination with nanomedicines, we believe that the right, right drug dose can be administered to the patients. Instead of a higher drug, right drug dose uh, being administered for the purpose of overcoming the absorption interface. Uh, so that's about my presentation. And prior uh, to end the presentation, just wish to highlight to you UITM uh, has participated in organizing the Malaysia Technology Expo 2020 Special Edition. Now, the submissions of the the information uh, has been starting. It started from now, and the submission due date is 30th September. Now, this MTE 2020 Special Editions uh, is a platform for awarding those scientists, industrialists, researcher, or even public that has a great contributions to COVID-19 prevention and treatment. And it comes in the form of COVID-19 International Innovation Awards. So we hope that the UITM families uh, can actually join us uh, in this uh, awards competitions, submitting uh, your ideas that has yet to be implemented. Or you can also submit ideas that has been implemented uh, with evidences. Right? So we have uh, different categories uh, for submission. Now, should you need more information, so you can write to my Yahoo or UITM email. Now, with that, I wish to thank again the UITM for the platform throughout the 17 years and also the organizing committee of today uh, for the kind opportunities for me to present. Uh, my postdoc from Pakistan, Nauman, Asif, my Malaysia student, Safi Aini, my Italian partner, Kara Kalamera, my South Africa partner, Pradip Kumar, my India partner, Priyanka Pata. Supporting staff, Nana, and supplier and manufacturers. Now, without them, I think we cannot move uh, that far. So we hope to continue working with them again for a better tomorrow. So with that, I will thanks. I will end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Wong Tingwei, for that very interesting presentation. And now I open up the floor for the questions session. And feel free to unmute your mic, or you can even chat uh, in the chat box. I will try to assist Prof. Wong to read your questions. Okay, Prof. Wong, actually there is one question uh, from Ahmad Suhail Kazali. The question is, I'm wondering how safe short term or long term is the microwave will it cause dna or cellular damage to the surrounding normal cell now, this is a very relevant and very good questions uh in my laboratory so far i have done only some a very little study acute toxicity looking at how lung liver and kidneys are being affected should the microwave penetrates uh, into the body 
But I guess there are more studies are needed so with respect to uh, genocytotoxicity and other form of cytotoxicity. And one may ask me, uh, will it be too early to use microwave as skin penetration enhancer? Uh, it may not be able uh, to realize as a commercial tool after all, because we need more safety study. So this uh, leads me to uh, wonder why we approve mobile phone to be used so extensively. In fact, some of us may have two or three mobile phone. So if you look at the mobile phone, the microwave that is irradiated from your mobile phone is of a higher power. And the durations that the consumer use the mobile phone can be one hour, two hours for a long chat and gossip. Whereas in our case, we are only using the microwave at a lower power for 2.5 minutes to 5 minutes. So this will be one of the so-called uh, rationales that I will put forward if our team decides to commercialize the tech, right? But of course, uh, to do toxicity tests, being acute, subcronic, acronic are still essential. But at the same time, we feel that it, that is not necessary. If you look at the mobile phone and toxicity, there are tons of articles that have been put forward. Uh, the outcome is mixed. Some indicates they may affect lymphocyte and DNA, RNA, but some say that that effect is transient, is temporary. And of course, knowing that mobile phone is a telecommunication device with great commercialization power, uh, there may be other hinder agenda, you know, uh, between the producer, government, and others. So I hope I have answered your question. Okay, another question by Dr. Andrian Hussein. Have you found any other target organ delivery other than skin cancer? I've done skin cancer and also delivery of uh, insulin uh, for the purpose of diabetes treatment. Uh, but I, in 2008 to 2012, we have actually uh, conducted experiments, uh, if I'm not wrong, using antibiotic because uh, knowing that microwave uh, can actually uh, negate the survival of Staphylococcus aureus uh, in the medical industry, we were thinking that maybe microwave will be good to kill the bacteria, yeah, to kill the microorganisms. So that could be one uh, strong justification why we use microwave to deliver antibiotic to kill the bacteria, because it provides synergistic action microwave itself can also kill the bacteria. Okay, another question by Dr. Nur Hafiza Razali. Any adverse effects to the local skin? Yes. If you use above a certain duration, you will char the skin. And note that the frequency that we have been using is 2,450 megahertz. Now, if you flip your kitchen microwave, incidentally, the kitchen microwave is also of 2,450 megahertz. So I guess that this frequency, uh, how shall I say, uh, can recognize our skin, interact with our skin compositions and bring about certain uh, physical chemical changes. 2454 megahertz with the use for a longer durations may actually char the skin. But in our case, we are only using one milliwatt microwave for less than five minutes, so it's rather safe. And further, we are using 2,450 megahertz. We are not using 900 megahertz. Now in our lab, we have conduct experiment using 900 megahertz. Now 900 megahertz is a very dangerous frequency because it will resonate with your skin, resonate with the body. Now our body actually resonate at 900 megahertz. When you use microwave and irradiate on a human object, both will resonate together and heating can occur within seconds. So this is rather dangerous if you use 900 megahertz. All right. Just a quick announcement yeah, to all the viewers and participants. Don't forget to sign in your attendance, which has been posted by the Secretariat.
So any other questions? I, I, I seen it from the chat. For the in vivo, is that melanoma on rats or normal skin? So in vivo, we actually use uh, normal, normal rats. Uh, of course, it will be good if we can uh, implant the melanoma cell suspensions uh, into the rats. Uh, however, we have failed to do it, partly because we are not using genetically modified mice. We are using the normal spread dolly rats. It appears that our rats are very strong, can overcome the melanoma cell suspension implant. Uh, we will still try again. I'm in the middle of applying some grant so to build the new mice. Now, cancer is an uncontrolled proliferation disease. So cellular arrangement will be different compared to in vitro and normal skin. Yes, I agree. Is there a higher risk of 5-FU toxicity with enhanced penetration? Uh, we do not conduct systemic adverse effect in skin project, but we do conduct uh, oral 5-FU delivery in a targeted manner also. And our finding is that uh, there is a reduced systemic adverse toxicity or no changes depending on the parameter. Commonly, we only look at uh, such as the creatinine, bilirubin, and all the hemoglobins, uh, platelets count. All right? So I think I have answered all the questions. So please feel free to contact us uh, if you are interested uh, to know more about the technology. So if no question, uh, we should stop at this moment. And looking forward to you uh, to join us at the MTE special edition. Yeah, the submission is open now until 30th September. Uh, all right, thank you so much, Prof. Wong. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, there is actually a request yeah, from Professor Dr. Ahmad to repost the attendance. So, hopefully, the Secretariat can repost the link for the attendance again. Yeah. So, by that, uh, I think I would like to end up this session. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Yeah. So take care. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, the organizer. Yeah.